Sorry, uh, we have a now the uh, lecture by uh, Professor Dario Stream from the Universidad de, de Buenos Aires, uh, and he's also an associate member of the uh, of the center. Okay, so I'm going to review a little bit of things that were already discussed, but I think it's good sometimes to slow down a little bit and to review some uh, important ideas. Uh, so I'm going to talk about QMMM, I'm going to talk about something about the basics of QMMM, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some applications of QMMM to spectroscopy and to reactivity. Uh, so, to begin with, <coughs> we can think about, I'm going to go to the very beginning, to the, the, the main ideas of uh, computer simulation in chemistry. So, if we want to do computer simulations in chemistry, we are going to be able to think about two ingredients, the t same two ingredients that Gustavo was discussing in, in his talk. The first ing ingredient is to define very carefully the, the, the energy, the potential energy surface that we are going to use. And we can talk about the model, the model chemistry we are using. Basically, uh, in which way we are going to compute the interactions in our, in our system to define the potential energy surface. I'm going to talk uh, essentially about uh, Born-Oppenheimer computational chemistry, the case that Nano was talking in which we need to include uh, the simultaneous motion of electrons and nuclei is outside of my talk. I'm going to suppose that we can think that the nuclei and the, the electrons move in different time scales, we are using the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and so we can define a potential energy surface. Is the potential energy as a function of the nuclear coordinates. Uh, for doing this, we have many possibilities, in principle possibilities based on quantum mechanics, possibilities uh, based on classical potentials, and in principle, if we are smart enough to define in a clever way this potential energy surface, we can obtain all the significant information that we need to obtain. Thermodynamical information, kinetical information, spectroscopic information, we can be able to obtain everything about our system. Uh, all the information is implicitly contained in this potential energy surface. But once we have defined the model, we know which kind of model we want to use or we are able to use, we need to think also a lot about different schemes to obtain the information about the potential energy surface. Because uh, uh, it is very easy to fall in the temptation to run simulations and then after I finish the simulations I think, okay, well, I, I, I didn't have learned anything about this simulation. And so the, the idea is to be able to solve questions, to lead to new knowledge, and in order to do this, it is very important to think about how to extract information once we have defined the rules of the game in the potential energy surface. And so we have very, a lot of techniques. Uh, the, the quantum chemists, started quantum chemistry by doing uh, geometry optimizations just to obtain structural information, optimizing the energy. But now we can do also other things like molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, uh, advanced uh, sampling techniques that we have already seen. Uh, and this is uh, mainly related of how we can play the game once we have the rules of the game. Uh, the idea of these things in a very basic way is to think chemistry as a Lego game in which we have the pieces that are the atoms, we are taking as granted the atomic theory, and so everything we can do is just 
play with this game, moving uh, from some part to the other, some group of atoms, and all chemistry is that, it's just that, it's just moving atoms and playing with interactions. And so, in principle, we can use QM for everything, because QM uh, is able to describe uh, chemical reactions, uh, spectroscopic properties, intermolecular interactions. So, in principle, QM is valid for er any system and is valid also for any property. And so, in principle, the, the idea was to use QM. Uh, uh, Gustavo has written the, in one of the, his first slides the, the famous phrase due to Dirac in uh, 1929. Uh, he said that the, the, the mathematics was already there, but it was much more uh, too difficult to be solved. But the idea is that now, with the advance of computers, we can solve at least approximately many things, and we can do quantum mechanics. But even if we can do quantum mechanics, there is a very hard limitation in system size due to computational expense. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, even if we can do a computation, a quantum mechanical computation for a very large system, it doesn't really make much more sense from a chemical point of view. If we want, for example, to study a, a protein in a membrane, catalyzing a reaction, it doesn't really make sense to put quantum mechanics on everything. Because it can lead to lots of information that are really useless, because we are interested in the chemistry of a small part of the system. So even if uh, there are some papers in the literature in which they, they study a whole protein by quantum mechanics, there are several papers that uh, calculate the myoglobin with quantum mechanics. Uh, it doesn't make really sense because the result is not really useful. You don't really learn anything about that result. And so, even if we can do quantum mechanics for very large system, uh, it's, it's not a very good idea from a chemical point of view. The chemists uh, really uh, tend to think in, in a multi-scale way of thinking. Uh, among the QM models, uh, in complex systems, the candidate of choice is DFT. Either DFT in the conventional way, or even uh, semi-empirical versions of DFT, like DFTB, are uh, the, the main uh, methods used in, in complex chemistry. When you do uh, materials or biomolecules, typically most of the works are done using DFT. Uh, on the other hand, the classical models are based on classical ideas, are very efficient numerically, but at, unless you parameterize on an ad hoc way uh, the process you are trying to model, they cannot deal with reactive processes. Uh, there are many typical force fields like amber, charm, gromos, uh, all of them are more or less equivalent, but they cannot deal with the, the breaking and forming of covalent bonds. And so uh, the question that arises is how to deal with this uh, problems that invo involve chemistry, chemical reactions in a complex environment. I'm going to focus most on biomolecules, but there are many people also working on uh, the same kind of uh, approach for uh, material science. Well, and the answer is a very uh, <coughs> smart answer uh, that is very rooted in the mind of chemists is the multi-scale method, uh, is the, to, to use multi-scale ideas. And this idea is uh, really an implementation, uh, an implementation that is due to these guys, the, the picture is behind, well, the picture is covered, but uh, <laughs> problems of compatibility between these different uh, operative systems. Uh, but Carl Plus uh, and Levit won the Nobel Prize for these achievements, and the, the achievements are really 
uh, not uh, very hard to understand achievements because the idea is an idea that almost every chemist has in mind is the idea that the, if you want to model a chemical reaction typically in in the chemistry courses if you want to study for example this reaction that is called SN2 for example this reaction that is a typical reaction of organic chemistry it's called an SN2 reaction when the chemists think about this reaction they put something like this they write down the reactants and the products and they, they put the solvent over the arrow meaning that the solvent plays a, a secondary role in this process and so the idea of thinking chemistry as a multi-scale thing is, a idea, is a, an idea that the chemists have very root in their minds and so to formalize this uh, idea that chemists have in their minds since long ago uh, is really a, a very attractive idea so how we do this how we do this well, we can do this in, in several ways. There are many ways in which uh, people have implemented this multi-scale approach. But the main idea of this uh, multi-scale approach, the, the main way in which people implemented this uh, QMMM approach is an ad ad additive scheme. And this ad additive scheme is a scheme in which we write down the total energy as a sum of three contributions a contribution due to the quantum part of the system, a contribution due to the classical part of the system, and the coupling term. This is a very uh, uh, intuitive idea. Almost everyone can understand this in a very uh, uh, easy way. This is the most common multi-scale approach. It's the QMMM approach. But indeed, you can have multi-scale approaches in other ways. You can also have a multi-scale approach using, I don't know, continuum plus classical mechanics plus, plus QM or you, ha you can have also uh, multi-scale approaches combining the descriptions of coarse grains as, uh, the, as the ones that Sergio uh, was talking about plus an atomistic uh, approach plus a QM you can have many layers of levels that can be combined in order to obtain multi-scale approaches uh, the QMMM approach is the most common approach uh, between this family of multi-scale techniques well we are going to restrict ourselves to Born-Oppenheimer uh, idea the Born-Oppenheimer idea is that you can uh, split the atomic motion from the electronic motion and we can say that we can solve the electronic problem in the field generated by nuclei that are fixed and so if we do this we can obtain the electronic energy as a mean value of the wave function uh, using the QM Hamiltonian and so the, the uh, quantum energy is going to be uh, given by an electronic energy by, uh, plus this term that is uh, a constant for a given geometry because we are assuming that we are solving the electronic problem for a nuclear fixed configuration and so typically we uh, use DFT for solving this this is written here in a wave function uh, formalism but indeed is exactly the same to 
write down the, the DFT version for the quantum energy or if you want you can use a semi-empirical version of the quantum energy the key player of the QMMM approaches the, the key issue for achieving success in QMMM calculations is to having a right description of this coupling term this coupling term uh, uh, is uh, due to an electrostatic interaction that is probably the, the main one the electrostatic interaction is the electrostatic interaction between the electronic density of the nuclear part I have written this here in the DFT way of thinking QMMM and so you have the the quantum part of the system described by, by its electronic density and so you have the interaction of the electronic density with the nuclear classical point charges and so this part is the interaction between the classical subsystem with the electrons of the quantum part and this is just the Coulomb law is a product of the charges divided by the distance the only thing that you have to take into account is that the, the electronic density is not given by point charges but is given by this density that is a continuum function uh, and you have to add also the interaction between the classical point charges with the quantum nuclei and so you have this is the electronic interaction typically people use the same point charges uh, for the classical uh, part of the system as the classical charges that are used for classical, purely classical models and this is due because uh, uh, you can achieve a consistent way you, you, you can use uh, standard force fields without uh, further parametrization and there is a typically neglected third term that is a term called here uh, Van der Waals term that is a very very important player of this story because if you don't put uh, this extra term QMMM doesn't work at all why QMMM doesn't work at all if you don't put that term because we are going to exemplify with a very small and this is system if we have for example a classical point charge for example one classical potassium ion and one quantum water molecule if we have a point charge here the classical potassium is represented by a point charge if we have this point charge here the point charge is going to enter into the quantum part of the into the quantum system and uh, you are going to have a collapse of the system that is not realistic so if we don't put this extra term here this term called Van der Waals term uh, you get uh, a problem and the, the program doesn't work the implementation doesn't work Estoy pasando al revés. And so, well, this term uh, that is typically called Van der Waals, the name Van der Waals is a name that the people give to it in the literature, but indeed it is Van der Waals. Van der Waals refers to the dispersion interaction that you can have when these things are very far apart is the typical Van der Waals interaction due to induced dipoles but on the other hand that is not the main player the Van der Waals is the long distance dispersion interaction but you have also a very important short, time, short range repulsion so this term that is uh, here accounts for both effects 
the effect of dispersion at long distances and the effect of the short range repulsion that you really need to be able to describe the system correctly. So you need a short re range de repulsion in order to be able to describe these kind of complexes in the right way. If you don't put the correct short range repulsion, the system collapses and it doesn't work. And this is a very important problem. Particularly people who, uh, working with uh, plane waves programs, the people, for example, that work with the plane wave implementation of QMMM, for example, with the Carparinello code, they have this problem is, is really very, very important because the wave function is written down in terms of plane waves. And so the plane waves can spill out and you have a lot of technical problems if you are not very careful with this short range repulsion. These two things are typically model with Lennar Schoen's potentials. Because if you have Lennar Schoen's potentials, you have you have something like this and with the Lennard Jones you have the attractive dispersion contribution and you model the repulsion with this R to the minus uh, 12 term. Why people use uh, Lennard Jones for modeling this? Well they use Lennard Jones because Lennard Jones come from from history. At the beginning of the simulations in the 60s, the computer simulations were really, really very expensive. And so uh, this function has the advantage that this term is just the square of this other. And so at, the, at those times, to perform one computation was really a big task. And so Leonard Jones were very attractive in the way that uh, uh, the repulsive term was computed simply as the square of the attractive term. There are many people working in the literature uh, in the last 10 or 20 years on how to improve this term, this uh, term that accounts for repulsion and dispersion. For dispersion, this is okay. This, is, this has really physics there because the dispersion really goes as 1 to the uh, r to the 6. But repulsion, you can use many other functions. And indeed, better ways to describe the short drain repulsion are exponentials. And there are people who are working uh, with exponentials and with di different combinations of functions to describe this short range repulsion and long distance attraction. But at the end, in, in, in some cases, it, it happens that you put more physics into the problem, you program, you run, and at the end, the results are more or less the same. And that was happened, that the people put a lot of effort and uh, parameterize very carefully other uh, repulsion forms that have, have more physics behind, but at the end the effect was very little, was almost nothing. And so at the end what happens? That most of the people keep working with Lena Jones' potential to describe this, these things. In most of the cases it is okay, uh, it works. But if you want to, it's, it's always important to keep this in mind because uh, this is really dirty, because you, you are putting quantum mechanics, you are putting DFT, but on the other hand, we are putting here something that uh, is uh, kind of dirty. And so if you want to connect your results with experiments, you always have to take in mind that you are putting this into your model, and so the agreement you, you are going to expect cannot be perfect. If you have a perfect agreement, it's probably casual. It's not uh, really true. Uh, you can pay a little bit of more attention to your problem, and in some cases, you can uh, parameterize 
This sigma is uh, calculated in the using a sigma for the, the quantum atoms and the sigma for the classical atoms. The sigma for the classical atoms, you cannot change it because if you change the sigma for the classical atoms, you are modifying the classical potential. You don't want to change the classical potential. But you can have some freedom changing the, the sigma and the epsilon for the quantum atoms. And in some cases, if you want to be very precise, you can work a little bit in parametrizing or paying some attention to the parameters for the quantum part of the system. Uh, in our experience, in some cases, we started by paying attention to the parametrization of the sigma and the epsilon for the quantum atoms. But at the end, if you want just to obtain some qualitative insight into, uh, I don't know, a reaction mechanism, uh, or you want to compare uh, the wild type protein with a mutant, it doesn't have many sense, much sense to waste time parametrizing because at the end the results are only going to be qualitative. You are only going to be able to extract trends, not really predictions that are quantitative. And so in, in, in that way, uh, it's, it's important to be uh, uh, aware that this is a dirty issue but I'm not sure if it's uh, worth the effort to waste much time trying to uh, parameterize this. Let me, let me interrupt. Yeah. Uh, so you do have sigmas and epsilons for the quantum part, or you have to compute them on the part? No, you, have, you use the typical combination rules. And so this, uh, when you write down this, this epsilon and this sigma are going to be obtained for the quantum and the classical part. Yes, but the quantum part, it's, it's on a file, it's fixed, it's fixed value, or you compute them? No, it's fixed. It. The sigma and the epsilon are fixed. Another question. Yeah. Okay. I, would have, I would have thought that uh, the, the quantum particle would be much softer in terms of the repulsion than a classical particle because of uh, quantum fluctuations, so it's uh, But it's still uh, the 12th uh, power. Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, we started, when we started with QM QMMM, with nano in nanosthesis, uh, we paid attention to parameterize this carefully. And so we were working with clusters and so we are putting one water molecule, putting a quantum water molecule, and trying to see, to reproduce the results of full quantum calculations. But when we started to work with proteins, we stopped paying attention. We just used the standard number parameters, and the, the results are OK. But we don't expect our results to match the experiments. We typically try to obtain trends. We don't claim that we are getting quantitative answers. Can I ask one thing more? Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, what happens when you have metals? Metals. We're going to talk about when you have metals. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you have metals, uh, and the metals are in the quantum part of the system, it, everything is OK. If you have metals uh, in the classical part, like magnesium or some, something like that, uh, yeah, maybe you have to be a little bit more careful. Because if you have, I don't know, a magnesium 2 plus, uh, maybe you have to be much more careful. But it works. Uh, we have done calculations uh, with uh, magnesium 2 and uh, you, you, we didn't see any splitting, but maybe you have to, uh, the magnesium 2 plus shouldn't be too close to the quantum part. Uh, yeah. No, I think it's not worth the effort, uh, unless 
uh, I don't know, if you are going to use, I don't know, DFT uh, with amber, uh, non-polarizable amber, a mean field potential, so you have already several sources of errors, model errors, and so it doesn't have much sense to put some effort in something that maybe is going to correct a little bit some part of the errors, but you still have remaining errors in other parts of your calculation. Uh, uh, the, this Leonard Jones, it's very important that this exists, because if it doesn't exist, you have a collapse, you have an unphysical result. But if the distance of potassium oxygen is 2.9 or 2.8, it's going to change the result. Because the result you're going to get is not the same, the quantitative number. But the trends are going to be the same. And if Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But we don't change the, in our simulation. We don't change the parameters of the quantum part. We could do that. In principle, that's not so difficult to do because maybe we can uh, uh, change. But the problem is that you, you, if you do that at some point of the calculation, you should have some uh, continuous match. Yeah. You cannot change the parameters, I don't know, in, in one point because you have a discontinuity in the energy. We haven't do, done that. One, one thing, uh, our worst problem is that the hydrogen, that the, there is no, have no, no, no quantum value in, in much. And when, when you have a quantum hydrogen, uh, in some case you have to put, put it, uh, some quantum yeah. parameters because yes. this, they need the quantum system if you don't. Yeah, that's, that's very important. So, in, in some cases, you have to put to to to, to <coughs> the other part, but, but it's, it's not a rule. It's just a, a set of Yeah, but it's not it's not very good in the sense that it's not very good. Because it's not very good. 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 It's not very it's just a, like a massive electron with a positive charge, or it does have a wave function associated with uh, it? No, it's, uh, the, pro the, the hydrogen should be in the quantum part, and so it's really a part of a full, yeah. <coughs> okay, so what have we done with this QMMM approach? Well, we started with QMMM uh, in two the parallel implementations. We started with one implementation in collaboration with people from Spain. Uh, it's a code called SIESTA. SIESTA means Spanish Initiative for the Electronic Structure of Thousands of Atoms. It's a program that has been developed in Spain in the 90s and this uh, localized uh, numerical basis set approach and it was, at that time, was very, very efficient, was much more efficient than Gaussian basis sets approaches. And so we started this collaboration mainly with a guy called Pablo Ordejón. Uh, he's a, a physicist in the Material Science Institute of Barcelona. And so uh, Damian Charles, during his PhD, went to Barcelona six months and coupled the siesta code to Amber, but to the amber force field, not to the amber code. We programmed the amber force field and made one code that is called hybrid, uh, that was very efficient, and we have been using this uh, siesta code for many applications during the last, I don't know, 10 or 10 years or so. And on the other hand, we have another code, a code based on Gaussian basis sets, that I have started a long time ago, that the Nano told you, uh, when I was a postdoc uh, in Cagliari uh, under the supervision of a very famous uh, computational chemist, Enrico Clementi. And when I, when I arrived to that postdoc in Cagliari, uh, Clementi was a very busy guy, and so he came to my office 
and he told me, I think you should work on DFT, because DFT is, is very important. And that was the only interaction I had with him. <laughs> uh, he, he came to my office several months later to ask me, uh, what have I done? But that was the only interaction. And he said also, uh, you have the pro to program uh, DFT and uh, uh, after a few months he said, okay, you have to include in your program the, the effects of the environment. Because uh, nobody takes into account the environment and the, the environment is very important. And so I started to work with that uh, Gaussian code and that's very nice because uh, it's a code in which we have a, a total, total control. Sometimes they ask to me and I don't remember because the, the memory is uh, short-ranged. But uh, we have a total control of that code. The, the code was totally developed by us. And then uh, Damian was working, Damian Charles was working in the code, Nano was working in the code, and then and now I don't have any control anymore because most of the code is programmed in CUDA and in other things that I don't have any idea. Uh, but this code now, with the uh, Nano's contributions, to, to port the code to, to be run in GPUs, is now much more efficient than the other one. And so now we are trying to put much of, your, of our efforts in this code because uh, we have more control on the code, and on the other hand, uh, it's more efficient computationally. What do you mean by Gaussian? There? Gaussian basis functions. Gaussian basis, okay. Yeah, it's the typical. Not to do with Gaussian. No, 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 no. No, it's simply that we use the same kind of uh, way uh, expansions that uh, most of the people in the quantum chemistry community use. But it's a program completely from scratch. Siesta uses numerical basis sets. And Siesta is a very peculiar program because it uses numerical basis sets and performs part of the computation in the reciprocal space. It's like a program uh, uh, made with the mind of the solid state physicists. And so it's a program in which we don't have a complete control. There are many parts of the code in which we, ha we ha don't have any idea about we can read how it, it was done, but it's a, it's a very extensive code and many parts of the code uh, we don't have control. In, in, instead, this other code, we know every part of the code. And so, well, Nano was telling you the, the latest news about the, the efficiency of this code. Uh, it runs uh, very fast. And so now we can afford to do something that is really important in quantum chemistry and most of the people don't do, or is to take into account something that uh, Gustavo was telling you about, to take into account in a balanced way both things. We can do something that is a reasonable representation of the energy because we can use DFT and DFT is reasonable and we can afford to do a reasonable sampling also. We can do sampling enough to obtain, for example, free energy profiles and to obtain good spectroscopy in real environments. We can do spectroscopy for things that are in real environments. And so these are the main goals that the QMMM code is good for. You can do spectroscopy in complex environments. This is useful because the experimental people always want to validate their results. They obtain some uh, uh, experimental results, they see a new band in the UV or they see something in the vibrational spectrum and so it's good if we can help in the interpretation of these experimental results. But the experimental results are 
at the room temperature in a complex environment and so if we can do spectroscopy in complex environments uh, it, it's very good to interact with experimental people and on the other hand the key issue in chemistry is always reactivity, chemical reactivity and chemical reactivity consists on having the thermodynamical picture to see if something is going to happen or not to, to see if some process is really feasible or not and to be able to uh, compute also the rates to see the, the rate or the relative rates and to be able to ox obtain kinetics And so I'm going to show you this result uh, is a result is a very old result it has more than 10 years but it was very nice because uh, it's a, uh, really easy to understand it's regarding the nitrate ion in freshman chemistry when you write down the nitrate structure you always write down the Lewis structure of nitrate like this this is the Lewis structure of the nitrate ion and we are using the notation that this is a pair of electrons this is an isolated nitrate with this way we have a one bond that is double and two bonds that are single but we teach the students in the freshman chemistry course that you have resonance structures and so that indeed the real structure is a superposition of three different resonance structures and indeed that these three bonds are equivalent when you have a nitrate that is isolated but the thing is that in solution this is not true the three bonds are not equivalent and the non-equivalency of the three bonds in solution is due to the fact that uh, the time scale of solvation the formation and breaking of hydrogen bonds has the property that makes this nitrate ion uh, asymmetric in, in, in aqua solution so uh, this hydrogen bonds have a lifetime of one picosecond two picoseconds and so in this time scale in the time scale of the picoseconds this nitrate ion is asymmetric you have one bond that is longer than the others typically the the bond the bond that is the bond that is longer correspond to the atom that is better solvated the atom that is better solvated bears a more negative charge than the others and so uh, has a longer nitrogen oxygen bond and so this is uh, very interesting we have done this work in collaboration with Adrian Reutler that Gustavo knows very well and Adrian uh, has been talking with uh, some people who have been performing uh, resonance Raman experiments of this species in solution and so the broadening of the bands in solution of the uh, vibrational bands in solution is related to this asymmetry and so we have been performing a long time ago at the time in which uh, the simulations were much more expensive than now a short simulation of this nitrate ion in uh, aqua solution and with that simulation we have been able to understand a little bit about the symmetry asymmetry of this ion and the connection with uh, solvation and the connection with spectroscopy another case using the same four atoms the same three oxygen atoms and one nitrogen atom we have been also investigating uh, a similar issue with this species that is called peroxynitrate this peroxynitrate is a very small issue it's an isomer of nitrate you have the same atoms and the same total charge 
But this species that is uh, very important from a physiological point of view because it has a very strong cellular toxicity, oxidates everything, nitrates everything, it has a, lo uh, a long history of uh, physiopathological uh, connotations. Uh, and so we have studied this because we have found a paper in which uh, they were reporting the resonance Raman vibrational spectrum of this species in aqua solution. And so we say, okay, we have the machin machinery working, we can see what happens with this. And so uh, this is the experimental spectrum. And uh, if you see the experimental spectrum, people usually, when they perform a, a vibrational spectroscopy, they assign the bands. The bands of uh, a vibrational spectroscopy are co collective motions, and so they don't really know to which motion each band corresponds experimentally. So in some cases, they know, uh, by analogy with other molecules, how to assign one band, for example, this band that they see uh, uh, in, the, in the spectrum, uh, how to assign this band to one kind of collective motion. And so there were some bands that were assigned, and so we tried to see uh, if we can predict this spectrum and we can help with the assignment of the bands. And so how can you do that? Well, you can do that uh, in a very easy way. It's very, really easy to extract vibrational spectrum from a QMMM simulation. If you perform a QMMM simulation, the quantum species is able to move as it wants to do. Uh, you have a complete freedom for the motion of this uh, atoms in the quantum part of the system, and so if you simply simply let the system evolve in time, if you let the system uh, evolve in time for a relatively long time compared to the vibrational motions, you sample in your molecular dynamic simulations enough vibrations of all the possible motions of the atoms in the molecule in order to extract from that simulation the vibrational frequencies. And so in order to do that, one way to do that is to compute the velocity autocorrelation function for each atom, and once you have performed the velocity autocorrelation function for each atom, you can extract the frequencies by uh, performing the Fourier transform. You can do that for the velocity of each atom, you can transform, if you want, Nano was suggesting an alternative method when we have performed this, this work, was to transform these motions to harmonic modes motions. It's like a change of basis, but indeed it's not really necessary. We can just work with the velocity of each atom of the system and compute this velocity autocorrelation function at the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function yields the vibrational frequencies. And uh, not only that you obtain the vibrational frequencies, that, uh, but you can also obtain the assignment from the simulation. And in this way, you can obtain the vibrational frequencies. If you are interested in the infrared spectrum, you can do exactly the same, but instead of calculating the velocity autocorrelation function, you can calculate the dipole moment autocorrelation function. If you use the dipole moment autocorrelation function, you obtain directly the infrared spectrum, because the infrared spectrum is directly related to this uh, dipole moment. If you want to do Raman or resonance Raman, uh, it's much more difficult. For Raman, there are some ways of compute the intensities, but for resonance Raman, that is a very extended technique uh, now a day for vibrational spectroscopy, uh, 
uh, it's not easy to obtain the vibrational the intensities. And so, well, what have you done with this? Thank you. Sí. You can compute the polarizability tensor instantaneously on from the You can, yeah. It's it's uh, expensive. it's expensive, but you can do it for for uh, as uh, Munir says for normal Raman, not resonance Raman, just plain Raman. You can com compute at each snapshot of the simulation. You can compute the the, polariz the, pol the polarizability tensor, and so for uh, Raman, it's it's. Uh, it, it is direct uh, to compute the intensity, it is expensive because to compute the polarizability takes some time. But for resonance Raman is something that we have in mind. We, we want to see if with the, the real-time DFT we can extract the resonance Raman intensities. Yeah, yes, one yeah. In your expression, your Fourier transform, yeah. uh, you are you you built a classical correlation function out of the velocities that were computed from a quantum trajectory. Yeah. Right. However, the expression involves not the classical time correlation function, but the, there is also involved the time reversal of that, and and so some factors appear from detail balance appears in front of the Fourier transform and that those types of quantum corrections affects the spectrum at high frequencies uh, yeah but indeed the the nuclei are classical the nuclei are classical the, the nuclei are, are the nuclei are classical and born oppenheimer so the quant the only quantum things are the electrons i know i know but we can talk about this okay later. i mean i mean the Expression yeah. itself that you use in the Fourier transform. There is a term in front of it okay. that comes from detail balance that introduces very important corrections in the high frequency part of this spectrum. Okay, no, we have not taken that into account. It's, we just compute just the 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 standard without any correction. Uh, well, the key issue here is that there was a band, that it was a very strong band, the, 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 the key band of the spectrum has been assigned experimentally to a torsion, to O-N-N-O-O -O torsion. Uh, what we have seen, and indeed Mariano saw it, is that this band was not really uh, corresponding to a torsion, that it was a stretching and the, the NO3 stretching. And we can see that the, the, the calculations can be performed in an harmonic way. You can, the typical way that quantum chemists predict the vibrational spectrum is just by doing the harmonic vibrational frequencies. The harmonic vibrational frequencies consist in writing down the energy Writing down this expansion, a Taylor expansion of the energy up to second order, the, well, the, the zero order is the, the energy at the minimum. The first order term does not appear because you, we are at the minimum, and so the first deri derivatives are all zero. And the second derivatives are called the Hessian matrix elements, are computed. And so you, if you diagonalize this matrix, the matrix of second derivatives, you obtain the harmonic vibrational frequencies. And this is very standard uh, proced procedure in quantum chemistry. All quantum chemists uh, buy the Gaussian code and perform a, a harmonic calculation for obtaining the for obtaining the harmonic frequencies. And so the harmonic frequencies, what we saw is that the harmonic frequencies changed a lot with the uh, method. For example, DFT 
predicted some some values that uh, were really close to the uh, high quality of initial methods and Hartree Fock was <coughs> very bad and uh, we see here that uh, the result of the isolated harmonic uh, for this problematic band was 522 and if we perform a, a uh, molecular dynamic simulation that we extract the frequency the frequency that we extract from a molecular dynamic simulation takes in, into the account the fact that the vibration is not harmonic and so this would be the vibrational frequency real vibrational frequency at this level of theory uh, corresponding to this band is 462 and if we take into account the solvent and the anharmonicity in the quantum simulation in the real solvent we obtain the value that is much closer to the experiment and so we see that the harmonic approximation uh, gives you an error the solvent produces a shift and this value is not so bad the value the harmonic value but indeed the value uh, obtained at the harmonic level uh, has some compensation of errors because you have some error for taking in, not taking into account the anharmonicity and some error for not taking into account the solvent if you take into account anharmonicity the values goes down and if you take into account anharmonicity and solvation you obtain the value that is reasonably in close agreement to the experiment in this case in particular as I have told you before we have paid attention to the parametrization of the Leonard Jones parameters and so how did, have, have we done that we have performed a calculation of the per peroxynitrate with one and two water molecules and we have calculated these complexes full QM, completely QM, and using the tip 4 p model for water for the water molecules. And so we tried to adjust the Lena Jones parameters to obtain these small clusters in the closer agreement that we could obtain with the full QM results. So in this case in particular we have paid attention for the the Leonard Jones parameters but for more complicated problems we haven't done that well another thing that I want to tell you do mind, do mind, uh, yeah in, those, in that slide you were showing yeah which one she, uh, the one with the energies yeah there's, there's something ¿Qué cosa? Ah. Por eso se pasa. Ahí está. Sí. Ya, this one. Uh, did you use any uh, energy shift to compare? Because the, the energy of the QM part is pretty different than the energy of the MM part. And when you have the tip. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yours, no, no, shift. we are just trying to adjust the interaction energy. We are adjusting the 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 interaction energy. Yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, the energy of a QM water is different than the energy of an MM water. Yeah. So did you shift the QM water? Uh, or, or to yeah, it, it, in some way, yes. Uh, what we have done is we have computed the water peroxynitrate interaction energy for, uh, at both levels of theory, and so we have tried to adjust the interaction energies is the binding energy, this is the total energy minus the energy of the peroxynitrate minus the energy of the water molecule in the classical case the isolated water molecule the energy is zero well the last thing I'm going to tell you about is that when you do QMMM this is very important because it's something that is probably not 
very much discussed in the literature. When you do, do QMMM, you have typically two ways of doing QMMM in the literature, in the act, present literature. One way to do uh, QMMM, that is the way that is done, I don't know, 99% of the literature is called electrostatic embedding. The electrostatic embedding <coughs> is <coughs> a way in which, is the way I showed you before the equations, uh, the QM part of the system feels and adapts to the classical environment. I'm going to put You, when you compute this row, this row is computed in the presence of the partial charges of the classical part. And so the, in this electrostatic embedding, QM adapts to MM. Adapts, it means that the wave function of the electronic density <coughs> is able to reflect what has around. It can polarize, it can move, it can do anything it, he, he or she wants. Uh, but the classical part of the system can adapt only geometrically. If we have a water molecule around the potassium atom, the only thing that the potassium... Suppose, uh, suppose we have two water molecules. And let's think that this is QM and this is MM. The QM water is able to move to adapt to the presence of the classical water and is also able to polarize. For example, this water molecule is able to build some more electronic density in this region due to the presence of the classical water molecule. Because this water molecule, in the quantum calculation, it's feeling the, the partial charges of the classical part. On the other hand, this classical water molecule can adapt only the position in response to the presence of this quantum water. But this hydrogen, for example, if we use SPC water, this hydrogen is forced to have the same charge as this other one. This is 0.41 and this is 0.41 and nobody can change that. And this is called electrostatic embedding. And this is the uh, approach that most of the people use. 99% of the people in the world use this electrostatic embedding. At that time, uh, when Nano was uh, doing his thesis, we, are very, we were very naive and we wanted to see if uh, going to this polarizable embedding in which we allow these atoms to adapt to the presence of the quantum part if it was going to change things, if it was going to improve things. And so we implemented in our code uh, with another uh, person working at, in our group in collaboration with uh, Daniel Laria, Dolores, <coughs> Elola, we were performing one approach that is called the fluctuating charge approach. It's a way to introduce polarization in the classical system by allowing the partial charges to fluctuate. And so we program, Dolores has programmed this uh, uh, fluctuating charge scheme in our code, particularly for water, and so we implemented 
a model of water called tip for p f q in, in which the charges are able to adapt and so that's done in a numerical way using a fictitious lagrangian it doesn't matter too much the technical detail, details but the issue is that uh, when you have this polarizable embedding you allow this hydrogen to be different from this other one and so this is able to be more positive than this other one because he wants to be more positive because it, it has an electronic negative density close to it uh, and so we have programmed that and when we have done that we saw something terrible that when you do that the results do not improve the results maybe improve uh, in some result and some others do not show any improvement at all you can see here for example that the result of this band with uh, tip well this improved a little bit from 973 to 943 and the experimental was 931 but this other one uh, this improved this didn't improve so it was very noisy some things improved a little bit some some others did not improve and so uh, we were a little bit sad with this result but, uh, but uh, after that uh, there were several other attempts of people working with polarizable embedding and all of them arrived more or less to the same conclusion that the results, even if the physics was much better, the results were not much better. Yeah? There are fully polarizable models for water, like deep five Ps. Yeah. I'm not sure how I'm, I'm not sure how they've done uh, how the load is did the, the fluctuating charge model in this scheme. I presume they reparameterize the whole thing to reproduce pure water. The tip five P, say you say. No, this tip four P F Q we we have taken the, the implementation is is an implementation from uh, Bruce Byrne. He had done, the, we didn't invent this, we just have taken the classical tip 4 pfq uh, that was uh, reported in the literature and implemented in the QMMM scheme. So the, the pure classical thing was already done. And it improved a little bit some properties regarding, for example, dynamical properties, time scales. For example, the, the, the time scales were a little bit improved, but for energetics and structure, the things do not improve. Probably, if we want to see the, I don't know, the, the lifetime of an hydrogen bond, is much better described by the, 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 the polarized um, um, model than the, from, for the other. Yeah. Uh, what has to be that, that could be done is to simply increase one layer of the quantum yeah. to see and do you have an idea how much those results would have changed if instead of doing this polarizable model we would increase it one layer for the quantum region so to actually explicitly do uh, we haven't done that this was done like 10 no, years ago no, so it was at that time we can we can not do that now um, yeah it can be done okay. but no, that would be an upper limit yeah. for the, the possibilities yeah. of correction yeah, the, what Leandro says, it's, it's, it's a very interesting proposition because if you want to take into account polarization, one thing you can do uh, trivially is to increase the size of your quantum system. Because if you increase the size of your quantum system, you allow for polarization maybe of a second shell. Because if your second shell is quantum, it's polarizable by, by definition. And so one way to take into account the polarization of a larger region is to increase the size of the quantum part. And probably I think that's the, the best option. If you want, yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder how, how much 
how better those results would become by doing that? that we are not I don't know, yeah. The possibilities that yeah, it's the, the well, another possibility is that the, the PBE functional is the, maybe it's a limit of the PBE functional. Maybe even if you go to, to full QM, you, you don't get it right. <laughs> yeah. Some people have done these kind of calculations, full QM. For example, the people working uh, with the, the Carparinello code can do the calculation full QM, and they don't, even with full QM, they don't get the quantitatively right answer. Yeah. May I ask one question? Yeah. This is for a cluster, right? Yeah. Small cluster. Not so small. How, how many water monitors? I don't remember, at 100 or something. No, 200 or more. Or, yeah. before the periodicity yeah. in the code. Well, one thing that you can obtain uh, with your simulation is that you can obtain insight about the one thing that uh, when we interact with experimental people, the experimental people always want to get some microscopic insight into the results. So to obtain the vibrational frequency is nice to obtain the number is okay, but the number is, doesn't say much. What says a lot is to try to understand the reasons of the number, why a band is broader than, than other band, uh, and that can be understood in terms of solvation. If you, you watch the snapshots and you see the solvation, you can see that the variability in solvation patterns is what causes that the bands are broad. It's, uh, it seems trivial because, uh, I don't know, it's something that we teach in the physical chemistry courses, but uh, it's very nice to see that, uh, uh, that it happens, that uh, the variability in the solvation patterns may allow you to explain the variability of the, re the results. <coughs> well, with this, uh, I'm going to review a little bit what, what I have been talking about. Mainly, if you want to use QMMM, you are going to use spectroscopy or reactivity. And so we have been talking a little bit about spectroscopy this morning. I have been talking a little bit about vibrational spectroscopy, and Nano was telling you UV visible spectroscopy. One thing that uh, uh, maybe we can clarify a little bit about what Nano was telling you is that uh, when you want to obtain UV visible spectrum from a QMMM simulation what we do is like a combination of several methodologies we start by a classical molecular dynamic simulation after that classical molecular dynamic simulation we run QMMM molecular dynamic simulations and from that QM, QMMM molecular dynamic simulations we, ex we extract snapshots from the QMMM molecular dynamic simulations and that each Q QMMM structure uh, we uh, compute the uh, absorption spectrum by using the real-time DFT approach. The real-time DFT approach is an approach that considers that the nuclei are fixed and the only thing that are allowed to move are the electrons. And so we have a certain number of snapshots obtained along the quantum uh, uh, molecular dynamics uh, trajectory and by adding all the spectrum of these different snapshots, we obtain a spectrum that has into account the variability of the uh, solvation patterns. Uh, how many pictures uh, you use for uh, typically 100 or something like that? 
Uh, and you need also, it's very essential that before you do the QMMM, molecular dynamic simulations, you perform a very long classical molecular dynamic simulations. Because the QMMM molecular dynamic simulations, it cannot be very long. And so you have to explore all solvent possibilities or all protein possibilities in the case of a protein with a long classical molecular dynamic simulations. From that, that long classical molecular dynamic simulation, you start short QMMM molecular dynamic simulations, maybe two or three, and from those QMMM molecular dynamic simulations, the pictures to perform the real-time DFT calculation. And so you are able to obtain not only the position of the pits, but also the broadening of the pits. Uh, on the other hand, to perform the traditional spectrum calculation is much easier because you need just one QMMM trajectory. But of course, if the system is very complex, you always have to resort to classical molecular dynamics before. You cannot do QMMM calculations without having performed first classical molecular dynamics simulations. It's like a, a, a rule. Uh, Gustavo was also telling us the same thing, that you need to know a lot about your system with classical molecular dynamics simulations before to start the QMMM simulation, because if not, you may uh, obtain uh, results that are in error because you have maybe you didn't consider all the possible structures of the system or all the possible fluctuations. Yeah. May I just add one comment? At some point in the, in the beginning of the talk, yeah. you mentioned that if we have the potential energy in surface, uh, the this hyper complex. Then you have everything in the case. Yeah. But then there is one thing that is for population. Which, which one? Is the population. So not only the potential surface, but you need the statistical mechanics. Of course, yeah. 